My name is Claire Wells. Welcome to my presentation on the central nervous system. Um, the image here is a representation of the connectome, which is basically a map of every long distance uh, axonal connection in the human brain. So these, um, these lines that you see in the image are representing bundles of axons running from one part of the brain to another. Just uh, FYI. Right, so before we go on, I'll just briefly review the relationship between the central nervous system and the rest of the nervous system. Um, the nervous system as a whole can be divided into the central and the peripheral nervous systems. Um, the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system uh, includes all the nerves that are running to and from the central nervous system. Um, the peripheral nervous system is further divided into the sensory division and the motor division. For the sensory division, uh, you have sensory information uh, coming from sensory receptors and going into the central nervous system um, along nerves. And then the central nervous system will integrate that information, sort of interpret it and decide what's to be done about it. And the central nervous system will then issue commands, motor commands, that travel out in the motor division of the peripheral nervous system, uh, ultimately going to your muscles and or your glands so that you can respond to your environment. And before we get into the central nervous system proper, uh, we need to talk about what surrounds it and how it's protected. So we'll Okay, so the brain and the spinal cord are actually the most protected organs in your entire body. That's because they're incredibly important. Um, most forms of homeostasis are regulated through the brain, and as well as your, your ability to move through your environment and interact with the environment. So uh, the central nervous system is extremely important to keep protected. But in addition to that, it's also very fragile. Uh, as you may remember, nervous tissue does not contain protein fibers in its extracellular matrix, which is generally where the strength of extracellular matrix comes from. So since the extracellular matrix for nervous tissue is essentially nothing but ground substance, that makes the tissue extremely fragile and very easy to damage. So it requires a lot of protection. Uh, accordingly, you have the central nervous system being encased entirely by bone. Uh, so, of course, the brain is encased in the skull, uh, and then the spinal cord is running through your vertebral column um, so that it's surrounded both by the, the bone of the vertebrae and by the, uh, the tough cartilage in those intervertebral discs. Um, so the nice thing about that, all that bony protection for the central nervous system is that it helps, um, it helps protect the central nervous system from impacts. Uh, but the drawback is that it makes the central nervous system vulnerable to swelling because if that tissue starts to swell up, there's nowhere, there's nowhere for it to go. Um, it can't really get, it can't get larger because it's constrained by the bones that encase it. So if you have extensive swelling in the central nervous system, um, that's going to cause uh, cells to die, basically. Um, yeah, the brain will kind of be crushed against the skull and some of the cells will die. Um, so apart from the bones protecting the central nervous system, you have additional protection um, from the meninges, which are a layer of three membranes that surround the, the central nervous system. Uh, you also have the blood-brain barrier, which prevents substances from the blood from moving into the central nervous system. Um, and then you have the ventricles, uh, which are filled with CSF. Ventricles are open cavities inside the brain um, that also communicate with the central canal and the spinal cord, which is just an, a little tube, a hollow tube that runs the length of the spinal cord in the center of it. Um, those ventricles and the central canal together are filled up with cerebral spinal fluid, um, which is basically giving buoyancy and shock absorption to the central nervous system and uh, helping remove waste. So I'll go through each of these elements in more detail. Starting with the meninges. Um, so the meninges is, again, three membranes that surround the, surround the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, the outermost one, which is the thickest, is the dura mater. Uh, it's made of dense, regular connective tissue. It has two layers 
the most superficial layer of the dura mater is actually considered part of the periosteum of the skull. Um, between, like in certain places um, within the skull, those two layers separate, and then between them you have um, the dural sinuses, which is where cerebral spinal fluid drains. Um, beneath the dura mater, you have the subdural space. And then beneath that, you have the arachnoid matter, which is the middle membrane. Um, it's also made of dense regular connective tissue, but it's much thinner. Um, you have little, little pores um, going from the arachnoid matter, crossing the subdural space, and connecting with the, the dura matter and the, the dural sinuses specifically. Um, so there's basically yeah, just little holes connecting the arachnoid matter to those dural sinuses. Um, those are called arachnoid granulations, and that's how CSF drains uh, into those dural sinuses. Um, then beneath the arachnoid matter, you have the subarachnoid space, which contains most of the blood vessels that would be supplying the brain with oxygen, um, and it's also filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Crossing the subarachnoid space, you have arachnoid trabeculae, which basically um, prop it up so that it doesn't collapse. Um, and then beneath that, you have the pia mater. Um, so that's both the thinnest membrane and the, the deepest membrane surrounding the brain. Um, it's made of loose connective tissue. Um, wherever you have, I, th I think I have an image of it on the next slide, actually. Okay, I do. So um, right here on this side, you can see the dura mater on the top here, um, and then beneath it, the thinner arachnoid matter, and then the subarachnoid space is right here. Uh, and you can see those uh, trabeculae, the arachnoid trabeculae crossing it right there. Um, and then you've got blood vessels running through that. Uh, and beneath it, you have the pia mater, which is very thin. Wherever the blood vessels branch to send little arteries down into the brain tissue to supply it with oxygen, the pia mater actually follows those, those vessels. So those vessels are always contained technically within a space that's continuous with the subarachnoid space. Um, and they're always separated from the nervous tissue itself by pia mater. Um, so your blood vessels are never directly exposed to brain tissue. Um, and, and that's part of the blood brain barrier. Um, right, so on the other side here, you can see the dura mater. Um, this is the top layer of the dura mater, which is actually the periosteum for the skull. And then here's the bottom layer of the dura mater. And then here's the arachnoid matter. And finally, beneath it, the pia matter, which is transparent and very thin. And then in the middle here, you can see a, a dural sinus. It's right here. So that would be where cerebral spinal fluid is draining. Um, this whole subarachnoid space here would be filled with cerebral spinal fluid, um, which in certain spaces, wherever you have a dural sinus, sinus you're going to have those. Um, arachnoid granulations crossing the dura mater and draining that fluid into, into the dural sinus right here. Okay, now for the ventricles. Uh, so in the brain you have four ventricles that are all connected to each other and then in the spinal cord you have the central canal. Um, so let's see, here um, that would be a lateral ventricle. You have another lateral ventricle behind it on the other in the other hemisphere of the brain. Those are connected with uh, this ventricle, the third ventricle, which is directly in the middle of the brain. Um, oh, the lateral ventricles actually curve around; so they continue around. Um, and then uh, the third ventricle at the bottom here um, connects with the fourth ventricle, which is actually just this uh, space right here by the cerebellum, right? So it's it's just this right here. Um, and then that continues down into the central canal of the spinal cord. Um, so 
the ventricles would be completely filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Um, right here at the base of the cerebellum, there's uh, some little pathways that the cerebrospinal fluid can take to exit. Um, the exit, exit the ventricles and enter the subarachnoid space. Um, the ventricles are going to be lined with ependymal cells, which is a special type of glial cell that's found in the central nervous system lining ventricles. Um, and within these ventricles, you have um, specialized ependymal cells and found in the choroid plexus. Um, where you have a lot of capillaries that are leaking uh, leaking plasma out into the ventricles basically and that's where that's where the cerebral spinal fluid is formed out so ultimately it's derived from the blood um, in these in these uh, parts of the ventricles called the choroid plexus and then it circulates around the ventricles and exits into the subarachnoid space um, it's kind of continually being made and then draining into the veins. So the whole volume of CSF that you have is replaced um, about twice a day. And here's an image of how, um, how that cerebral spinal fluid is made and is drained. So here you can see the choroid plexus in, um, in the third ventricle, and uh, the arrows represent fluid exiting the choroid plexus into coming into that ventricle. So that would be the cerebral spinal fluid being filtered out from the blood. Um, and then it can travel around all the ventricles. Um, it would exit down at the base of the cerebellum into the subarachnoid space, um, which uh, surrounds the whole brain, but it also continues down around the, the spinal cord. Um, and then wherever you have a dural sinus, so a space between those two layers of the dura matter, um, you're going to have your arachnoid granulations that allow the cerebral spinal fluid to enter the dural sinuses, and then those dural sinuses drain into the veins. So the CSF ultimately is coming from the blood and it's returning to the blood as well. Okay, the blood brain barrier. Um, the blood-brain barrier is a barrier between the blood and the brain, as the name suggests. Uh, it's formed from three, three structural uh, features. Um, so first you have the specialized endothelium in capillaries, that lines capillaries um, in the brain. So those, those capillaries are aligned with the uh, simple squamous epithelium, so a single layer of flat cells that are connected to each other with a lot of tight junctions, which basically makes it impossible for fluid to leak between those cells, which means that if the fluid is going to exit the capillary and get into the brain, um, or if something within the fluid is going to exit the capillary and get into the brain, it has to be specifically transported across the endothelium by those cells that make it up. So nothing can sort of accidentally leak between the cells the cells actually have to intentionally transport something across. So they have receptors for glucose that will allow them to pick it out of the bloodstream and transport it across themselves, across their cell bodies, and um, and the, you know uh, eject it into the brain, basically. Um, so that's the, the tight junctions between endothelial cells lining the capillaries that serve the brain. Um, that's the main feature that um, that forms the blood brain barrier, but you also have um, astrocytes, another type of glial cell in the brain. Um, wherever you have astrocytes near capillaries, they're going to send out their processes to the capillaries and kind of uh, spread them along the surface of the capillary to form these things called astro astrocytic end feet, uh, which you can see right here. So the capillaries are going to be kind of coated with those end feet of the astrocytes. Um, so the astrocytes are, through their end feet, able to influence the endothelium surrounding those capillaries, uh, which is uh, one reason why the, the endothelial cells have so many tight junctions between them. The astrocytes have influenced them to, to make all those tight junctions. Um, and, and then finally, you have the pia matter, which uh, every, every larger um, vessel or vein in the blood 
uh, that's not a capillary. Um, it's going to be in a little space that's surrounded with the pia matter so that that vessel is not actually directly exposed to, the, to nervous tissue ever. So those three factors are making up the blood-brain barrier, but it's mostly based on tight junctions between the endothelial cells that line the capillaries in the blood. Um, and uh, Sorry, the capillaries in the brain. <laughs> um, so the main purpose of the blood-brain barrier is to keep stuff in your blood, out of your brain. Uh, of course, that, that can include toxins that you have in your blood um, sometimes, but also it includes just hormones that you have because um, most neurotransmitters in the brain also function as hormones in the rest of your body. So if you have uh, those hormones traveling in your blood, if they're able to actually enter the brain, the brain is going to treat them like neurotransmitters. And basically, the signaling within the brain will get all kind of mixed up. Mixed up. Uh, the brain will think that messages are being sent, but actually, actually, it's just these hormones leaking over from the rest of the body. So that's one reason why it's really important to have that blood-brain barrier there. Um, it's really good for, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's actually crucial for allowing the brain to function, but it does have some drawbacks, uh, especially whenever we want to deliver drugs to the brain, uh, because any drug that's going to be useful for a condition that affects the brain has to get into the brain. Therefore, it has to be specifically transported across the blood-brain barrier by those endothelial cells that line capillaries in the brain. Um, so for instance, for Parkinson's, that is a disorder caused by um, dopamine neurons in the brain dying and there is um, some movement circuits in your brain which we're going to talk about later um, that require those dopamine cells to be influencing like the way the circuit works in order for it to actually function um, so if those dopamine neurons are dying then your motor circuits are basically not going to work right and you're not going to be able to do voluntary motions um, normally so the most direct way to to sort of treat Parkinson's would just be to give people dopamine. Uh, that that is the neurotransmitter that they're lacking in their brain. So if you could just put it there in the brain, then you know their symptoms would stop. Um, but dopamine is also a hormone in the periphery, so it is not or in the rest of the body. So it is not transported across the blood-brain barrier. So you can't use it as a drug for Parkinson's. So instead what they do is they use L-DOPA, which is the precursor for dopamine. So L-DOPA, because it's a precursor, is specifically transported across the blood-brain barrier by the endothelial cells. So L-DOPA will be taken into the brain and then whatever dopamine neurons the person has left will be able to use that L-DOPA to synthesize dopamine. So it'll basically make extra dopamine, kind of making up for the dopamine cells that had died. Um, but, of course, the problem with that is that, you know, once all of your dopamine neurons are dead, um, there aren't any neurons left that would be able to use L-DOPA to make dopamine. Uh, and at that point, of course, the treatment doesn't work. Okay, so uh, all of the protective features that the brain has to keep it safe, the spinal cord has as well. Um, and they're mostly just the same. So it's also surrounded by three meninges the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. Um, in this image here, the dura matter is the outmost layer here. Um, the arachnoid matter is just beneath it. And then you have uh, the pia matter um, is right against the actual spinal, the spinal cord itself. Um, and it's really thin, so you can't see it very much. But you can see um, you can see the little ligaments that connect it to the arachnoid matter. So this space between the pia matter and the arachnoid matter is the subarachnoid space, and that is filled with cerebrospinal fluid as well as the central canal in the center of the spinal cord. Um, then wherever you have uh, nerves exiting the spinal cord, the dura matter and the arachnoid matter follow those nerves, and they form um, this, some of the membranes that that surround those nerves in the peripheral nervous system and keep them safe and protected. The pia matter itself, um, you can see it going out into the into the spinal nerves right there. 
uh, but it doesn't surround the outside of those nerves. Um, usually, if if we want to see what's in the spinal fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid, um, we're going to sample that from, well, I guess always, we would sample that from the spinal cord uh, through the intervertebral discs um, so that you don't have to drill a hole <laughs> through, through bone to get at it. Um, because the cerebral spinal fluid is, in the spinal cord is continuous with the cerebral spinal fluid in the brain, um, sampling it from the spinal cord can be really useful to diagnose things that are going wrong with the brain. Um, because any molecules that are associated with a condition, a neurological condition that you have, they're probably going to end up in the cerebral spinal fluid since it's removing waste from the brain. And since it's all, um, all the cerebral spinal fluid can, is, is, uh, so all the cerebral spinal fluid is in communication. Therefore, any substance in one part of the cerebral spinal fluid will be in the rest of it. So you can sample it in the spinal cord and find out what substances are circulating in the brain. Um, and again, in the spinal cord, you have the essentially the blood brain barrier, but it has a slightly different name, the blood spinal cord barrier, since it's around the spinal cord. And again, it's mostly composed of tight junctions between endothelial cells lining capillaries um, that serve the spinal cord but you also see the astrocytic in feet. Okay, now we can go into the actual parts of the central nervous system. Um, so the brain is divided into four big parts and then each of those big parts has smaller parts within it and each of those smaller parts has smaller parts and then those parts generally have sub parts as well. Uh, so there's lots of levels of structures in the brain and we'll only talk about the first couple of levels. Um, yeah, but there's like hundreds, hundreds of different structures in the brain. So the four main parts of the brain are the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. The cerebrum is the big part here. Um, that That is functioning in all of your higher functions and basically like your personality. Um, so that's the part that allows you to use logic and critical thinking. Um, it allows you to um, interact with your fellow human beings um, and it allows you to exert self-control um, and to, it allows you to produce and understand language as well. Um, the cerebrum also is what allows you to interpret stimuli. So um, as visual information, Francis, is coming in from your eyes, the cerebrum is what's going to actually take that raw data and turn it into an image that, that you're able to perceive. And not only that, but then every object in the image will be identified by the cerebrum. Um, so the cerebrum is crucial for your being able to perceive the world around you and understand what you're perceiving. Um, and it's also crucial for um, initiating voluntary motor actions. So the cerebrum is the part of the brain where you decide what you want to do and then a motor command is generated that will actually make your muscles do that thing. And finally, the cerebrum handles emotions as well, um, which, which means basically that the cerebrum is accounting for most things that you think of as making up your personality. The cerebrum is the part that's most sort of uniquely you. Um, then you have the diencephalon, which is this kind of blue ball in the center of the cerebrum. It would be, uh, of course, within the cerebrum, so it's, well, it's deep to the cere cerebrum. Um, the diencephalon does some information processing, um, but for the most part, it's relaying, most of it is relaying uh, sensory information from the spinal cord to the cerebrum and also relaying motor information from the cerebrum to the spinal cord. So for most of your senses, all of the information associated with them as it comes in from your sensory organs, it's gonna stop in the diencephalon first. It'll be processed a little bit and then it'll go on to the cerebrum uh, so it can be actually interpreted fully. Um, also, another part of the diencephalon integrates um, most of the functions in your brain. 
uh, well, at least very many of the functions in your brain together. Uh, and it basically kind of serves as a point of communication between your higher functions in the cerebrum and your lower functions in sort of the brainstem. Um, then you have the cerebellum, which is the red part kind of at the bottom of the brain, at the bottom and in the back. The cerebellum, the cerebellum is all about motor coordination. Um, so evolutionarily, that's extremely important. Um, as you can imagine, if you're trying to hunt food or run away from a predator, you have to have a high degree of motor coordination to be successful. So the cerebellum has been very important in evolution. And then finally, you have the brainstem, which is this purple area here. Um, which is coming out of the bottom of the diencephalon and then runs between that and the spinal cord. So the brainstem is handling all the most basic aspects of your homeostasis. Uh, so it is where you have control of your lungs and heart um, and your reflexes and your autonomic motor system, uh, which of course is the branch of the motor system of the motor division of the, of the peripheral nervous system um, that that controls your involuntary muscles and your glands. Uh, you also have some um, relay of information in the brainstem. Of course, sensory information coming up from the spinal cord has to pass through the brainstem on its way higher up, and motor information from the cerebrum has to pass through the brainstem on its way down. Um, so the brainstem relays those that information and also does some information processing on it. Um, and the brainstem is also the source for most of um, what are called the classical neuromodulatory transmitters. Um, that would include dopamine, serotonin, uh, and epinephrine, or well, norepinephrine. Okay, so once again, this big part out here, that's the cerebrum, handling all of your higher functions um, interpreting stimuli, initiating voluntary motor movements, and um, handling your emotions and your logic as well, so basically forming your personality. Then beneath it, you have the diencephalon relaying information um, to and from the cerebrum and the rest of, this, of the nervous system, uh, and also integrating higher functions from the cerebrum with lower functions from the brainstem. Um, then you have your cerebellum right here, which is responsible for motor coordination for your voluntary motor movements. And then finally, the brainstem right here, also relaying information to and from the cerebrum and the rest of the nervous system um, below it, um, and also handling or well, controlling your, your heart, your lungs, and your autonomic nervous system. Okay, uh, the cerebrum itself can be divided into the cortex and into subcortical structures. Uh, so the cortex is the top part of the cerebrum um, that has all the squiggles on it. And then beneath the cortex, you have the subcortical structures. The cortex is divided into four lobes and the insula. And then um, there's a variety of subcortical structures that are beneath it but the main ones are the basal nuclei, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. Then finally, you have a number of white matter tracts connecting one side of the cerebrum with the other, so connecting the two hemispheres. Uh, the most prominent one is the corpus callosum. Okay, so getting into the different lobes of the cortex, um, you have the frontal lobe, which is about like so. Um, that lobe is where you have your critical thinking and logic skills, as, as well as math skills. Um, also your self-control, your discipline, and that means also your politeness, since politeness is a form of self-control. You also have your voluntary motor control there in the frontal lobe. So in this, um, in this uh, light, light red region, uh, that's your premotor cortex, so that's where you're going to be planning voluntary motor movements. 
and then the dark uh, the darker red strip that's just behind it right here um, that that is the primary motor cortex that's where all your motor commands to your skeletal muscles are initiated from and that also defines the end the um, the uh, posterior end of the frontal lobe okay next you have the parietal lobe that um, starts at this blue strip right here and it kind of it continues back this way roughly to right there um, its posterior and inferior boundaries are a little uh, poor they're a little ill-defined um, or a little loosely defined uh, the parietal lobe is responsible for attention so where, where you are directing your attention also your sense of touch um, your sense of balance uh, understanding language and um, sort of interpreting sensory stimuli or perceiving stimuli um, yeah well interpreting and perceiving stimuli so the blue strip in the front that's your primary uh, somatosensory cortex so that's the part of these um, of the brain that you're using to interpret touch sensations um, and then in this circle you can't see it very well but it's right here this would be um, Wernicke's area which is responsible for um, your ability to understand language uh, the rest of the parietal lobe is for the most part, part going to be involved with um, your intention your attention um, also spatial uh, perception so understanding how objects are related to each other in space and then uh, also just perceiving and interpreting sensory stimuli so you have parts of the parietal lobe that are going to kind of identify for instance objects that are in an image that you're looking at so within your field of vision and then also uh, kind of draw up your your memories about those objects and your understanding of what they are so in the parietal lobe you would be identifying for instance a chair that is in your field of vision as being a chair um, and then and then not only that but you're going to in the parietal lobe access whatever memories you have about that chair so you might recognize it as specifically your chair or your favorite chair that would be in the parietal lobe um, in the temporal lobe that's the one that's on the side so that's right here kind of goes back roughly that much um, again its posterior border is not well defined uh, the temporal lobe is responsible for your sense of hearing and smell and balance um, in conjunction with the parietal lobe and also for language uh, comprehension in conjunction with the parietal lobe again and for sensory perception and interpretation so um, this little blue uh, blue spot in the temporal lobe that's your primary auditory uh, cortex so that's where you're interpreting or that's where you're sort of um, assembling a, a soundscape or in interpreting auditory information and then um, once you've interpreted that information or perceived it um, it would go out to other parts of the temporal lobe where you would identify uh, what what different sounds are and, and what's making them and draw up any memories you have related to sources of sounds uh, Wernicke's area extends a little bit down into the temporal lobe so both the temporal and the parietal lobes are responsible for language comprehension um, then you have the occipital lobe that is at the back it's roughly this roughly this um, the occipital lobe is all about vision so it contains your primary visual cortex which is the, the little blue part there um, that's where visual information is arriving at first from your eyes and also it's just kind of interpreting um, an image so converting that raw data from your eyes into an actual image that you can perceive and then the information would go out into the parietal and temporal lobes uh, so that objects in the image can be identified um, there's also the insula which you can't actually see in this image of the brain but it's it's right kind of in this crack 
um, on the on the next slide I have a picture of it. Um, the insula is responsible for your sense of taste and your sense of your internal organs. So usually um, any sensory, sensory information related to your internal organs um, you don't really have conscious access to but some like occasionally you do. So for instance if you ate way too much then you're perceiving a sense of fullness in your stomach and you would be perceiving that in the insula itself. Um, so this kind of roughly what those different lobes are associated with functionally um, but there is overlap between the lobes um, right so you don't have like like for instance Wernicke's area the overlaps it's mostly in the parietal lobe but a little bit of it is in the temporal lobe um, right so these lobes are just kind of uh, things that we've defined and actual circuitry within the brain is not necessarily organized um, with respect to the boundary lines of the lobes. Most of the cortex uh, in the image it consists of association areas, so everything that's kind of um, everything that's beige, and then most of the stuff that's uh, a lighter red, most of that stuff is association areas. Um, association areas are parts of the cortex where information is converging from different um, sensory systems um, or just different systems in general and it's sort of all being interpreted together so in the associ association areas is where you would identify objects in an image that you're looking at so the chairs and the tables uh, but you're also going to be associating that with memories that you have about those objects um, so the association areas are kind of crucial for the function of the cortex and well specifically the higher functions such as um, interpretation uh, like you know sophisticated interpretation of stimuli um, and logic and and stuff like that okay so here's that image larger um, I guess the insula is on the next next slide um, Right, so here's your frontal lobe stopping at the red strip, which is the primary motor cortex. So the frontal lobe, again, is involved with logic um, and planning and self-control and politeness or social, social graces. Um, you also have speech production there um, and control of your voluntary movements. So let's see, right here, oops, right here. Uh, this is Broca's area, so that's the part of the frontal lobe that's involved with producing speech. So the muscle movements needed to actually produce speech. speech. Um, the kind of more shaded area here is your premotor cortex that's involved with um, planning voluntary motor actions. And then the red strip at the back is your primary motor cortex um, where all of your voluntary motor commands are initiated from. Then just behind it, the parietal uh, lobe starts and runs about roughly like that. Um, that blue strip is your primary somatosensory cortex, so that's where all of your touch information is first arriving in the cortex, um, and then it will then be interpreted. The parietal lobe is also involved with intention, attention, um, spatial awareness, so knowing where you are in space and where objects are in space. Um, interpretation of stimuli and perception. Um, then you have the temporal lobe on the side here, about like so. That includes the, the little blue spot, which is your primary auditory cortex, um, which is where auditory information is first arriving to the cortex. So the temporal lobe would be involved with interpreting and perceiving that information. Um, also between the parietal lobe or shared between the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe you have your sense of balance and also you have Wernicke's area responsible for uh, comprehension of speech or language. Finally in the back roughly there you have the occipital lobe entirely devoted to, um, to visual processing to processing information from your eyes and then here, here you can see the insula, um, it's right here.
So if you were to kind of pull down the temporal lobe, there's a little bit of cortex hiding inside of it, and that is the insula, where again, you have your sense of taste and um, perception of your visceral organs. Um, you may notice, well, of course, uh, the most prominent aspect of the cortex would be all the squiggles that are on it. Um, those are gyri, and the, the, the little um, rigid, uh, the little um, depressions between them are sulci. The purpose of those squiggles is, or the gyri and the sulci, is to increase the surface area of the cortex. Uh, neurons in the cortex are arranged into columns, where every neuron in a column is related to the same function. Um, so if you can increase the number of columns in the cortex, then you can increase the number of functions that the cortex can do, basically, or the processing power of the cortex. So we have a lot of those gyri and sulci, um, which gives us quite a large surface area for a cortex. Um, the sheep brain has much fewer uh, gyri and sulci, and they're not as, as pronounced, so they're not as deep. Um, so its cortex has a lot less surface area. It doesn't need to do as much, as much intense processing. Okay, then we have the subcortical parts of the cerebrum, which are the basal nuclei, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. Um, if you're looking at an old, older source, you might see the basal nuclei referred to as the basal ganglia. Um, the basal nuclei consists of the caudoputamen and the globus pallidus. Uh, the caudoputamen is also sometimes called the, the striatum. Um, the function of the basal nuclei is to gate voluntary motor movement. So anytime you decide to do something, you're going to use your premotor cortex to plan that action, and then your primary motor cortex will generate the command signal that's going to go out to your muscles. But before it actually does, it's going to go to the basal nuclei first. And the basal nuclei has to let that signal through. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to do the actual movement. So the basal nuclei is supposed to allow you to start moving when you want to, and it's supposed to allow you to stop moving when you want to. Um, the purpose of it is to reduce like noise so that you're not moving on accident. Um, the basal nuclei is the brain circuitry is is the brain circuit that um, that isn't functioning right in people who have Parkinson's disease. Um, it needs to receive a dopamine input from the brainstem in order to function correctly. And in people who have Parkinson's, the neurons in their brainstem that make the dopamine are dying. So the basal nuclei doesn't get the dopamine that it needs to function right. And then um, as time goes on, people who have Parkinson's will not be able to start a movement when they want to. And once they get going, they won't be able to stop the movement when they want to. Um, then when all of their dopamine neurons are dead, then, you know, then they would be basically paralyzed um, and un unable to start voluntary movements. Um, then you have the hippocampus and the amygdala, which are connected to each other. The hippocampus is, uh, it functions in learning and memory. Um, so it's important for your ability to learn and to form new memories. Memory is not stored in the hippocampus, it's stored in the, in the cortex, but you have to have the hippocampus to, to learn and to form the new memories. Um, then the amygdala is primarily involved with pr processing emotions, so just allowing you to have and feel emotions. Um, both of them are connected together in what's called the limbic system. So some of you may have heard of the limbic system. It's a system in the brain that controls your emotions. Um, and it's basically different structures that are all connected to each other that have some role in, in controlling emotions or in processing that's related to emotions. So the amygdala would be the heart of the limbic system. Um, it's the primary place where emotions are processed in the brain. And then the hippocampus is closely connected to the amygdala. That way, um, your emotions can help you learn, basically. So if something happens that you have strong feelings about, you're going to remember that thing well because of this connection be between the hippocampus and the amygdala. Okay, and here's images of that. Um, so let's see, right here, the green... Oh, <laughs> Uh, the green, jeez, okay, cool. 
these green structures um, are the basal nuclei. Um, right, so you have this light green thing, this whole thing is a stratum, or the caudopudamen, and then the dark green thing behind it is the globus pallidus, and together that's the basal nuclei that are involved with gating voluntary motor movement. Um, so sort of deep to that, or inside, um, to the inside of that, you have um, the diencephalon, which is shown in blue right here. So here's your diencephalon, and then right on top of it, right on top of it, you would have your uh, your basal nuclei. Um, this large uh, orange structure is the hippocampus, and then the little pink ball at the end of it is the amygdala right there. Um, so the hippocampus would basically be wrapping around the outside of, of the striatum right here. And again, the hippocampus is involved with learning and memory, and the amygdala is involved with emotions. Okay, now on to the diencephalon. Um, there's four parts of the diencephalon, four large parts. Of course, each of those parts has its own subparts, and the subparts also have subparts. Um, but you have four main structures, larger structures in the diencephalon. So you have the thalamus, the subthalamus, the epithalamus, and the hypothalamus. Of those, the thalamus and the hypothalamus are the most important. Your thalamus is your relay station, so all sensory information that's coming in from your body, um, up from the brainstem, and going to the cortex, all of it stops in the thalamus first, except for smell. Smell goes directly into the cortex without stopping, but everything else, so touch, vision, taste, uh, hearing, and balance, all of that is going to go through the thalamus before it gets to the cortex, which means the thalamus has the opportunity to sort of modify that sensory information as it passes through. Also, all voluntary motor information coming down from the cortex stops in the thalamus before it continues on down to the spinal cord and the, and the nerves. Um, so the thalamus has the opportunity to influence that motor information as well. So for motor information, that would start in the cortex, then it goes to the basal nuclei to be gated, and then it goes to the thalamus. And from there, it would proceed on down to the spinal cord. Um, then you have the subthalamus, which is beneath the thalamus. Um, you have structures in the subthalamus that give input to the basal nuclei that sort of function with the basal nuclei, uh, specifically the subthalamic, subthalamic nucleus. Then you have the epithalamus, which is on top of the thalamus. Um, the epithalamus contains the pineal gland, which secretes melatonin, which is the hormone that allows you to sleep. Um, the secretion of melatonin from the pineal gland is controlled by the hypothalamus, which is the last part of the, of the diencephalon. The hypothalamus is also below the thalamus, um, but it's also below the subthalamus. And its, its role is basically to integrate your higher and your lower functions and to control hormones. Um, so the hypothalamus is integrating almost any function you have that could influence homeostasis. Um, it's controlling your temperature. Your body temperature is actually primarily controlled by the hypothalamus. It controls the secretion of hormones from the pituitary gland. Um, it, in, it controls drinking, um, so when you're, when you're thirsty and when you drink, it helps control when you eat, um, also helps control sleeping, and finally, um, uh, your autonomic nervous system. Uh, it helps control your autonomic nervous system. Oh, and reproductive behaviors. Uh, reproductive behaviors are primarily controlled from the hypothalamus, so that's everything from mating to actually raising children. Um, so in general, you, you can get by without your hypothalamus, but you can't get by quite right. You won't be quite right. Um, so the brainstem is, primarily, is the primary source of control for your autonomic nervous system. Uh, and so you know that will still be functioning correctly 
will still be functioning if you don't have your hypothalamus. But your hypothalamus is what allows the function of the brainstem to be coordinated with the function of the cerebrum. Um, so that's what allows your sort of complex understanding of your situation to influence how your body is being controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So it allows the functioning of the autonomic nervous system to be appropriate to whatever situation you're in that you're understanding using your cerebrum. Um, you also have the master clock of the brain located in the hypothalamus, which is the basis for all daily rhythms and all seasonal rhythms in the brain and in your behavior. Um, so for certain species that have like a mating season, like a specific part of the year that they mate in, that's controlled by the, uh, by the master clock in the hypothalamus. Um, it receives information from the eyes, um, specifically receives blue light from the eyes to know when it's, when it's daylight and when it's night. So throughout the day, um, you would be receiving this blue light signal uh, to the master clock in the hypothalamus, and that's how the clock knows that it's daytime. And then at night, when the blue light stops, <laughs> um, that's when you know the master clock knows that it's nighttime now. Uh, and so whenever that blue light stops, that's when that's when the hypothalamus tells the pineal gland to start manufacturing melatonin so you can go to sleep. Um, so that worked well when we didn't have like sources of light at nighttime. But now we have a lot of light at night, and especially like screens have a lot of blue light that they emit. Um, so looking at screens late at night can interrupt your production of melatonin because your, your master clock will basically think that it's still daytime. Um, and that, that can interfere with your ability to sleep. Um, so for your phones and all their, like they have uh, apps that will filter out the blue light. So, um, so it's more like nighttime friendly. Um, the hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary gland, so the pituitary gland is basically coming off the bottom um, of the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus controls the release of hormones from the pituitary gland. Um, so almost all hormones, it's not literally all, but almost all hormones are controlled ultimately by the hypothalamus through the pituitary gland. Um, you also have parts of the hypothalamus that have a leaky blood-brain barrier. Uh, so that some substances from the blood can actually get into the brain in the hypothalamus. And that allows neurons in the hypothalamus to keep track of what nutrients are in, in your blood. So the hypothalamus has neurons that can sense the osmolarity of your blood and how much glucose it has, how much amino acids it has, how much fat it has. So the hypothalamus knows what your nutritional status is. And it uses that information to basically influence whether or not you are hungry. Um, right, so the hypothalamus is receiving information from all over, um, directly from the bloodstream. It's receiving information also from the brainstem and also from the cerebrum. And it's basically putting all of that information together um, to influence how different systems are controlling homeostasis, including uh, your endocrine system and the autonomic nervous system. Um, and it also has the master clock. Okay, so here's um, pictures of the diencephalon. So the thalamus uh, is the biggest structure in the diencephalon. It's these big blue lobes. Uh, I guess here, this is an anterior view, so this is looking at it from the front. Um, this is looking down on it from above. And here's your thalamus again, um, which again is the relay station. Um, all, sen all sensory information except, except for uh, smell that's going into the cortex stops in the thalamus first, and all voluntary motor information that's coming out from the cortex and the basal nuclei stops in the thalamus before going to the spinal cord. Um, let's see, in your, in your superior view, you can see the epithalamus right here. Um, the pineal gland is sticking out the back of the epithalamus. Um, whoops. And right, so of course you have, you have melatonin released from the pineal gland to allow you to sleep. 
Then you have the subthalamus um, and a side view of the diencephalon. You can see the subthalamus uh, right here beneath the thalamus. And then sort of to the front of that, but also beneath the thalamus, you have the, uh, the hypothalamus, which is involved with um, integrating higher and lower functions and controlling homeostasis. Right, so that controls the pituitary gland. Um, the pituitary gland is right here. That's controlled by the hypothalamus. Um, the hypothalamus has the master clock for your body, and it's also basically receiving information from your blood, from the brainstem, and from the cerebrum, and coordinating all of that information together to, to decide what should be done for homeostasis. Um, and it controls uh, well, heavily influences your eating and your drinking, uh, your reproductive behaviors, uh, your sleep patterns, uh, controls hormone release from the pituitary, um, and helps control the autonomic nervous system. Okay, then the cerebellum um, in the back and at the base of the brain, uh, it has its own cortex. It has the cerebellar cortex. Uh, which also is lined with ridges that again increase the surface area so that you can get more function in a shorter or in a smaller volume. Um, it has several lobes and beneath those lobes of the cerebellar cortex you have the cerebellar nuclei um, which are balls of cell bodies that are involved with processing for the cerebellum. And right so the cerebellum is receiving it's receiving information um, about what your intended motor actions are. So <clears throat> as you have um, motor commands to your skeletal muscles that are coming ultimately from the cortex, that signal, that command signal is going to branch. Part of it is, well, you know, part of it's going to go to your skeletal muscles and then the other branch is going to go into the cerebellum. So the cerebellum knows what it is that you had meant to do. The cerebellum is also receiving sensory information, um, primarily proprioceptive information. So that would be information about how much tension is in your muscles and about the angle that your joints are at. So basically <clears throat> where your where your body, like how your body is, is positioned and how much strength or how much tension is in your muscles. Um, and also on top of that balance, uh, the cerebellum is receiving sensory information about balance. So based on all that incoming information, the cerebellum can know what you meant to do and also what you actually did do. And the cerebellum is basically going to correct future motor signals um, to make sure that they are in line with what you wanted to do. So it's based, it's determining how far off you were from your intended action and it'll it'll correct future motor signals so that they will actually produce the intended action. So the cerebellum is it handles motor coordination, but it also handles motor learning um, and stores muscle memory, probably. So without without the cerebellum, you wouldn't be able to learn to do any sophisticated motor task like riding um, or you know playing like sports. And then finally, you have the brainstem. Um, the brainstem is divided into three main parts, which of course have their subparts, and the subparts have subparts. Uh, the three main parts of the brainstem are the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Um, those are in order from superior to inferior. So the midbrain is at um, basically at the bottom of the diencephalon. The pons is in the middle of the brainstem, and then the medulla oblongata is the sort of the most inferior part of the brainstem that actually merges with the spinal cord. Um, the brainstem includes uh, central pattern generators. A central pattern generator is a circuit um, of neurons that has intrinsic rhythmic activity. That means that the neurons are going to be firing in a rhythm without any outside input. So if you have that circuit completely disconnected from the rest of the brain, it'll make the same pattern of activity over and over again. Um, so you have central pattern generators controlling um, certain stereotyped um, 
motor actions or actions that occur the same way every time you do them. So for instance, swallowing, um, the way that throat, throat muscles have to coordinate in order for you to swallow is the same time every time you swallow. They have to contract and relax in the exact same pattern. Um, so that's controlled by a central pattern generator in the brainstem. Um, right. So in the midbrain, in the midbrain you have the orienting responses, which is a sophisticated reflex. Um, you have a visual orienting response and an auditory orienting response. For the visual orienting response, um, basically it's a reflex in which if you see something moving out of the corner of your eye, you will turn your head to look at it. So turning your head to look at something moving in the corner of your eye is an orienting response. You are responding to that movement by orienting to put your attention and your eyeballs on the stimulus. Um, and then you have a similar thing for, for, um, for hearing. So if you hear a noise uh, that's not in your field of vision, like sort of a loud or startling noise, you will turn your head to look at it. Um, uh, so the orienting responses are uh, handled by the colliculi, the superior and inferior colliculi, which you can see um, at the top of the midbrain. Um, you also have pain perception being uh, kind of gated in the midbrain. So in the midbrain, you have a structure called the paraaqueductal gray, which is responsible for letting pain signals go through to the cortex or not. Um, so um, controlling pain and pain relief um, in the brain is, well, primarily occurs in the midbrain. Um, you also have um, some structures in the midbrain that send information to the basal nuclei. Uh, prominently, you have the substantia nigra, which is the uh, primary source of dopamine in the brain. So most, most dopamine neurons in the brain are in the substantia nigra in the midbrain, and their axons go to the basal nuclei. So it's those substantia nigra neurons that make dopamine and send their axons to the basal nuclei. Uh, that that die in progressively in people who have Parkinson's. Um, going down, you have the pons. Um, the pons contains some circuitry that modifies the respiratory central pattern generator. Uh, that central pattern generator is located in the medulla oblongata. It controls your breathing. Um, it also it allows you to breathe by coordinating the muscle movements that are necessary for breathing. Um, and then in the pons, you have circuitry that's going to modify that to speed your breathing up or slow it down, depending on what, what you need. Um, right, so in the medulla oblongata, in addition to the respiratory uh, central pattern generator, you have the cardiovascular control center, which controls um, basically your heart rate um, and sort of the functioning of your of your cardiovascular system, well, so the heart rate and then the vasoconstriction in your blood vessels. Um, you also have um, the central pattern generator for swallowing in the in in the medulla oblongata. Um, in ANP two, you guys will learn about the baroreceptor reflex. That's a reflex that controls your blood pressure. Um, so in your aorta, you have some sensory receptors that sense your blood pressure and then they send the information to the cardiovascular control center in the medulla oblongata and then the information is used to modify your heart rate as appropriate. So if your blood pressure goes up that's going to be sensed um, by the baroreceptors in the aorta and then that information goes to the cardiovascular control center and the cardiovascular control center will then signal your heart rate to slow down which will then reduce your blood pressure back to a normal level. Um, so those are sort of the functions that are localized in one part of the brainstem or another part, but you also have some functions that occur in all three parts. Um, so sensory information that's coming in from the body and it's going up to the cerebrum has to pass through the brainstem first. Um, and then also motor information that's coming down from the cerebrum going out to the body passes through the brainstem as well. Um, 
Also, all of your information is going into the cerebellum and coming out of the cerebellum. It's uh, stopping off in the brainstem or being passed uh, through the brainstem to get there. Um, in the brainstem, you have your primary autonomic control. So um, the brainstem controls you, the activity of your autonomic nervous system. And the hypothalamus will influence how the brainstem is doing that, but the brainstem is the primary source of control for the ANS. Um, you also have the cranial nerve nuclei. Uh, the cranial nerves are exiting, uh, most of them exit from the brainstem. Um, those are nerves that go to kind of your face, uh, your head, um, and your neck, with the exception of the vagus nerves of the vagus nerve, which goes down into the abdominal cavity as well. Um, so each of those nerves, where it exits the brainstem, it has nuclei um, that are sending their axons out along the nerve or else are processing information that's coming in from that nerve. Um, and those nu nuclei are going to be located, you know, in different parts of the brainstem. Um, you also have the reticular formation in the brainstem. That's a group of many different nuclei in the brainstem. Uh, it actually has a lot of functions, but one of the main functions that it has is regulating your level of alertness and attention. Uh, so that is the reticular activating system within the reticular formation, and it's required to actually keep you awake and alert. Um, so the parietal lobe is controlling where your attention is directed, and then the reticular formation in the brainstem is controlling like how alert you are in general. Uh, so if, if you can turn that system off, the person will lose consciousness. So some anesthetics work by inhibiting the activity of the reticular activating system, um, and then the person will lose consciousness when it, when it turns off. Um, the reticular formation also includes the raphe nuclei. Those are, uh, those are the source of serotonin in the brain. So almost all serotonin neurons that you have are located in the raphe nuclei in the brainstem. And then their axons would travel out uh, pretty much all over the, rest, the whole rest of the brain. Um, Right, so in general, all of your classical neuromodulatory transmitters, which again are serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, those are the main ones. Um, there's also histamine. Um, those are all, well, with the exception of histamine, but serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, those are all coming from the brainstem. So the neurons that make them are located in the brainstem. And then the axons for those neurons will travel out to the rest of the brain. So in general, the brainstem is concerned with um, some of your most basic functions, but it also can influence some of your more sophisticated functions um, using those neuromodulatory transmitters, the serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Okay, here's an image of the brainstem. Um, so of course, here's your diencephalon on the top, uh, specifically your thalamus. Then going down from there, you have the brainstem. So first you have the midbrain here. Then uh, inferior to that, you have the pons. The cerebellum would be connected to the pons there. Um, and then inferior to that, you have the medulla oblongata, which then merges into the brains, uh, into the spinal cord. Right, so all of those uh, are controlling um, while well, they're passing information to and from the rest of the brain, um, they are controlling the autonomic nervous system. They have cranial nerve nuclei, so most of your cranial nerves exit from the brainstem, and each of them has at least one nucleus uh, associated with it. Um, you have your sources of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine there in the brainstem. Um, in the midbrain, you also have your orienting responses, so looking at something that is moving in the corner of your eyes or, or looking at something that made a sound where you can see it. Um, also in the midbrain, you have pain perception um, and the substantia nigra that gives input to the basal nuclei and uh, is damaged in people with Parkinson's.
Um, then in the medulla oblongata, you have your respiratory central pattern generator, your swallowing central pattern generator, uh, and your cardiovascular control center. Um, and in the pons, you have uh, circuitry that modifies the respiratory central pattern generator, so speeding up your breathing or slowing it down. Um, and then finally, uh, in, in the whole brainstem, you have the reticular formation, um, which is partly responsible for keeping you awake, or is, is needed to keep you awake. Okay, that's the brain. Now on to the spinal cord, um, which we won't talk about very much, but just a little bit. Uh, so the spinal cord, for the most part, is involved with relaying information from the body to the brain and from the brain to the body. Um, right, so mostly it just contains axons that are either coming in from the uh, nerves of the body and going up to the brain or else they're coming down from the brain and then they're going to go out uh, in the nerves. Um, but in the center of the spinal cord you also have cell bodies um, forming like gray matter um, and those cell bodies, some of them are involved with information processing, so some of them are interneurons. Um, Right, that are not actually connected to a muscle or to a gland or to a, a sensory receptor or to a sensory organ. Um, right, so in that gray matter of the spinal cord, you have some basic reflexes. So, for instance, um, like if you touch a hot surface, there's going to be a pain signal generated that goes into the spinal cord, and at that point, it's going to branch, and the signal will travel up to the brain, so you become aware of that pain. Uh, on, on one branch, and then on the other branch, it's going to connect to an interneuron, then to a motor neuron that's going out to the muscles of your arm, so that you can jerk your arm back and away from whatever you know you had touched. Uh, so that way, um, that's a reflex. So even as you're becoming aware of the fact that you touched something hot, you're already jerking away from it, um, so that you know, so that you can stop touching it faster. So it just helps you respond to the environment more quickly. Um, you also have in the spinal cord gray matter central pattern generators for gait, so for walking and for running um, and stuff like that, and, you know, jogging. Um, so they've actually done some pretty messed up experiments in cats where they, uh, they cut the connections between the spinal cord and the brain of the cat. And if you take a cat like that and put it onto a treadmill, um, the cat will actually start walking on the treadmill. Uh, and then if you speed up the treadmill, the, the cat will speed up how it's walking or start running to keep up with the treadmill. So that's how they figured out that gait um, is actually controlled and coordinated from the spinal cord itself. So even without the brain, you already have just in the spinal cord enough processing uh, ability to, to walk. <laughs> Um, the spinal cord is divided into four parts, the cervical spinal cord, the thoracic, the lumbar, and the sacral. Um, the cervical part and the lumbar part are the thickest uh, because that's where you have all the neurons that are related to your arm nerves and your leg nerves. Um, all along the spinal cord you have nerves exiting uh, that are part of the peripheral nervous system. So. Right in this segment of the spinal cord that's shown here, you have your spinal nerves exiting. And then it also shows an interneuron right there in the spinal cord gray matter. So that would be involved with a reflex or potentially with a central pattern generator for gait. Okay, those spinal nerves, um, they're used to divide the spinal cord into segments. Each segment of the spinal cord has two nerves exiting from it, one on each side. Um, and then each spinal nerve has two roots. One root is anterior and one is posterior, where sometimes they're called um, ventral and dorsal. So, um, one of those roots is carrying sensor, sensory axons and the other is carrying motor axons. So the dorsal root has sensory axons that are going to be entering the spinal cord and then the ventral root has motor axons that are going to be exiting the spinal cord. Um, and then those roots fuse, fuse together to make a nerve. 
And those nerves, again, are coated by the dura and arachnoid matter from the spinal cord itself, uh, but not by the pia matter. And then um, one other thing that's, that's good to know about the spinal cord is that it's, it's actually shorter than the vertebral column. Um, as you are developing, the vertebral column grows longer than, than the spinal cord does. So um, the sacral spinal cord segments are actually located um, like more like in the thoracic region of your vertebral column. Um, and then the nerves will end up going, like continuing further down within the vertebral column to exit um, between the appropriate vertebrae. So for instance, for your um, S1 nerves in the first sacral segment, that actual segment is located um, further up, maybe right here or so, um, in the spinal cord, uh, you know, with where you have your thoracic vertebrae. But then the nerves that are coming out of that segment are going to continue down in the vertebral column all the way down to the sacrum and exit at the beginning of the sacrum. So uh, at the bottom of your vertebral column, you actually don't have the spinal cord in there. It's just nerves. Uh, and that spray of nerves coming out the bottom of the spinal cord is called the cauda echina, which, is, which means like the horse's tail. Within the spinal cord, um, you have gray matter in the center, as I mentioned, and then that's surrounded by white matter. Um, the gray matter is divided into horns. So you have the anterior horns right here, one on each side, also sometimes called the, um, the ventral horns. Um, you have motor neurons located in, in those horns. So these uh, red dots here, those would be the cell bodies for motor neurons. Um, and then those axons are gonna exit along the anterior root or the ventral root of the spinal nerve and then continue in the actual spinal nerve proper to a muscle. Um, in the posterior horns, which would be right here, those are also sometimes called the dorsal horns. There you have your sensory neurons. Um, well, so I guess the actual sensory neuron would be located in the dorsal root ganglion, but then it's going to send its axon in to the spinal cord and it will synapse in the, in the posterior horns of the gray matter um, on, on the cell body for a, for a second order sensory neuron. Um, that's basically just taking information. Technically, it is an intraneuron, but it's called a second order sensory neuron because it's just taking information from um, an actual primary sensory neuron and then sending it up uh, into the brain. Um, so, you know, it's not actually doing information processing, it's just relaying the information. Um, then you also have a small lateral horn. It's right here, right here, right here, maybe a little bit of right here. Um, the lateral horn uh, contains motor neurons for, for the viscera. So, so the, the anterior horn is going to be motor neurons that are going to your skeletal muscles. And then in the lateral horn, you would have the motor neurons that are going out to your, your visceral organs. So those motor neurons would be for the autonomic nervous system. Um, you only see the, that in certain parts of the spinal cord. Um, only in the thoracic and lumbar regions, actually, which is where your sympathetic nervous system um, exits the spinal cord. Um, for the white matter, it's divided into tracts um, that carry sort of organized information. Um, so you'll have one tract that's carrying touch sensory information up the spinal cord into the brain. You would have another that's carrying motor information coming down from the brain going out to the body. Um, you have another one for pain information. Um, in general, the tracts are called funiculi. So you have like um, you have like the lateral funiculus right here that's carrying pain information going into the brain, and also some motor voluntary motor information coming out.
Okay, and here's our overview of um, all of the brain structures that we talked about. So um, you have the cerebrum is the biggest part of the brain um, involved with um, higher functions, logic, emotion, personality, um, perception, and interpretation of stimuli, um, <coughs> that sort of thing. And then uh, so the diencephalon is a little hidden here, but it's this blue thing in the middle. There's your diencephalon that would be involved with relaying information and integrating information. Um, then the brainstem controlling the autonomic nervous system and your most basic functions. Uh, and then the cerebellum at the back controlling motor coordination. So if we look at the subparts, um, for the cerebrum, you have the cortex, which is the outermost beige part shown here. Um, that's divided, divided into lobes. So you have the frontal lobe, um, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and then the occipital lobe in the back. Um, frontal lobe handling logic primarily and voluntary motor actions. Um, the parietal lobe handling attention, spatial awareness, um, and interpretation and perception, um, as well as touch sensation. Uh, the temporal lobe handling auditory information um, and also interpreting uh, stimuli and perception of stimuli. Um, parietal and, and temporal are sharing the sense of balance and uh, language comprehension. The occipital lobe is just vision, visual perception. And then what's hidden is the insula that would be located um, right in this little crack or fissure between the temporal lobe and the frontal and parietal lobes. In there you have the insula um, handling the sense of taste and uh, uh, your vis sens sensation related to the visceral organs. Then you have the subcortical structures within the cerebrum um, right here is your basal nuclei and then it wraps around uh, the basal nuclei gate voluntary motor movements so they allow you to do things that you want to do and allow you to stop doing those things and just cut down on twitchiness um, these blue structures on the outside of the basal ganglia uh, are actually the ventricles those are the lateral ventricles circulating making and circulating CSF around the brain um, then the orange loop there, just inside the diencephalon, or sorry, just inside the basal nuclei, um, that's the hippocampus, and the little pink ball at the end of it is the amygdala. Hippocampus is handling learning and memory, um, well, formation of memory, and then the amygdala handles emotions. Um, inside the basal nuclei, you have the, uh, the diencephalon, in the very middle of the diencephalon, you have the lateral ventricle. Most of the diencephalon is the thalamus. Um, that is a relay station. All sensory information, except for smell that's going into the cerebrum, stops in the thalamus, um, stops off in the thalamus. All motor information coming down from the cerebrum stops off in the thalamus as well. Um, then you also have the hypothalamus beneath that. So the hypothalamus can be seen right here. That's connected to the pituitary gland, um, which isn't shown here, but it would be maybe right there. Um, so the hypothalamus is controlling the secretion of hormones from the pituitary gland. Um, it's integrating higher and lower functions um, for the maintenance of homeostasis. So it's influencing when you eat and drink, when you sleep, um, your reproductive behaviors, um, controls temperature regulation, uh, helps control the autonomic nervous system, or modifies how the autonomic nervous system functions, also contains a master clock, and is in control of the pituitary. Um, then your brainstem, um, the midbrain is this part right here. The midbrain contains the uh, circuitry for orienting responses, turning your head to look at something that you saw out of the corner of your eye or heard uh, somewhere that you're not looking at. Um, it also uh, can gate pain perception, um, 
and provides input to the basal nuclei. Then you have the pons right here um, that modifies the respiratory central pattern generator. And finally, the medulla oblongata at the bottom of the brainstem merging into the spinal cord that contains the res respiratory central pattern generator and the swallowing CPG and the cardiovascular control center. All of the brainstem is having, well, has nuclei for the cranial nerves and is controlling the autonomic nervous system um, and has the reticular formation, um, which uh, allows you to remain awake. And the brainstem is also the source for your transmitters, um, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine that heavily influence the way the rest of the brain functions. Then finally, you have the cerebellum right there that is controlling motor coordination and allowing you to make, um, to make muscle memory. And here's an image of the sheep brain cut in half. Um, so many of these structures can be identified in, in the sheep brain as well. Um, here you have the cerebellum uh, here's the medulla oblongata, here's the pons, here's your midbrain. Uh, the superior colliculus is right there, the inferior colliculus is right here. Those are the parts of the midbrain that handle the orienting responses. Um, here coding the brain, you can see the dura mater. And here at the bottom of the brain, you can see the pituitary gland. So that pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus, which is roughly right there. Um, at the front of the hypothalamus and at the bottom, you can see the optic chiasm right here. This is where the optic nerve is entering, is crossing uh, the midline and then entering the brain. Um, on top of the hypothalamus, you have the thalamus right there. And then you have, here's the cortex, of course. Um, this white line here, that's the corpus callosum. And let's see, just in here, you have the lateral ventricle. And um, right here, is your pineal gland that secretes melatonin. Alrighty, so that's that's the brain. Those are the parts of the brain. So thank you for uh, listening to this presentation and you know have a good day.